see who the coins are from. Mm. And the way um, he just simply says, on, Open my eyes to see Jesus seated upon the throne. Father, this morning, open our eyes to see Jesus seated upon the throne. Heavenly Father, have your way this morning. Yes. Your presence, your glory is already here. Lord. Yes. Father, remove all flesh this morning. Yes. Let your word be spirit. Let it be filled with power and authority this morning, Lord. Do what we've already determined to do this morning, Lord. We come in agreement with your will this morning, Father. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for your people this morning. Thank you for what you're about to do in Cutting Edge Ministries, Lord. Thank you for the city of God, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So we trust you this morning, Father. Yes, Be glorified. Be lifted high, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Can you say amen this amen, morning? Amen. amen. One more time, if we can, just clap onto the Hallelujah. Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Churches are coming together and we are entering into a season of what God is wanting to do. Um, I believe that many of us, we've been wondering or we've had the questions of God, what is your will? You know, what exactly are you going to do? Um, I know some of us, we are very detail-oriented people and so having all of the facts, having all of the answers, it's, it's, it's always a plus for us. And sometimes we, because we don't have all the information, sometimes it, it, it makes some of us a little weary. Um, why? Because we don't know what direction we're going. We don't know, you know, what we're supposed to do once we get there. But I believe that this morning um, that the will of God for what he wants to do um, it is twofold. There's an aspect of God that he does not reveal. There's an aspect of God that is hidden, is preserved just for him. And on the other side, there's an aspect of God pertaining to his will that he does reveal. And he makes it known. And this morning, I want to speak to you from that place. Um, first and foremost, um, I want to just thank Pastor Brad, Pastor Terry Ann for the opportunity this morning. Um, to minister the word of the Lord before you. Um, I thank God for Shirley, um, all of the leaders that's here this morning, and I thank God for each of your lives this morning. But again, I want to minister to you from that place of how do we discover the will of God for our life? Here we are, we're in a place of transitioning, and as we said, many of us, we want to know the details. Ask God, what are you doing? How are you going to do it? Once we get there, what then is your will for us? When the Bible speaks about the will of God, the Bible does not use the definitive one definition to describe what the will of God is. The Bible approaches the will of God from two perspectives. The first perspective is known as the decretive will of God. Can you say decretive will of God? The decretive will of God is when God declares something and he brings it to pass. The decree of will of God does not involve the participation of man. This is when God speaks a thing, and what he speaks cannot resist. What he speaks have to, has to come to life, and it has to come to pass. When it involves the decree of will of God, God does not ask for the counsel of man. He relies upon his own counsel, and by his counsel, yeah. he brings his will to pass. Amen. All right? Amen. Remember in Genesis, when the Lord declared, let there be light. Light could not resist God. Right. Light had to come into being. Yeah. All right? I want to just show you another scripture. I'm just looking at Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. And we're talking about the decree will of God. The prophet here declares, Remember the former things of old, 
For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish, whose purpose? My purpose. This is the decretive will of God. When God has purpose for something to take place, he takes the full responsibility of bringing what he has declared to pass. This merging that is taking place, this is not the will of man. This is by divine, the divine knowledge, understanding, predetermination of God Amen. for these ministries to come together and to become one church. Amen. We may not have the full understanding as to why and why now God wants it to take place. But when we don't know the why, we must trust the heart of God. Amen. When we cannot see the hand of God in something, we must trust the heart of God that God knows what he is doing and it is for our good. Yes. This is the decretive will of God. I just want to give you one more scripture. Psalms chapters 33 and verse 6 to 11. Psalms chapters 33 and verse 6 to 11. Look at what the psalmist says here. He says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Yeah. Now, what he's going to emphasize here when we're talking about the decree of will of God is his emphasis is on creation. All right? So the psalmist says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, by the, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Verse 9. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Verse 10. The Lord brings the counsels of the nations to nothing. There's an aspect of God where, where, where again, we said that he does not require the counsel of man. How many of us, we planned something, we predetermined something, and then when, when it came time to do it, God completely did something unexpected. Yeah. All right? This is what the psalmist here is saying. He brings the counsel of men to nothing. All right? He goes on and says, um, he says, he frustrates the plans of the peoples. This is not saying that when God has put something in our heart to do, that he just comes and completely changes that. This is in reference to our will versus his will. Yeah. This is communicating that when it pertains to God's decretive will, there's nothing you and I can do to change that. So what he will do is frustrate our plans to accomplish his will. Yeah. Can you say amen? Yeah. 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 So it goes on and says, verse 11, the counsel of the Lord it stands forever. The plans of his heart, the plans of his heart, his heart to all generations. So God has a plan for you that he has not completely revealed. If there's anyone here this morning who has ever said to themselves, Lord, is this it? The answer is no. This is not all that God has for you. Where you are in your walk with him, you have not even scratched the beginning of that. There is always more with God. And there's an aspect of God when it pertains to your life that he has not fully revealed to you. Some of you, you're wondering when it pertains to your own life, Lord, what's your will for my life? What do you want to do? How do you want to use me? The Lord will only show you part of that picture, but he reserves the entirety of it for himself. Amen. Amen. And so with God, we will never fully understand the full picture of all he intends to do, and that's okay. Amen. And that's okay. That is okay. The Lord now, he doesn't leave us there wondering. There's an aspect of him, we see through the scripture that he says, it doesn't involve you. But there's another part of God where he says, it does involve you. This aspect, the second aspect of the will of God, 
It's known as the preceptive will of God. What type of will of God is it? Preceptive. The preceptive will of God. This is the will of God that we can know. There are some things about God, or there are some things about our own lives that God does not hide from us. He makes it known to us. Lord, who do I marry? Lord, do I take this job? Where does my family move? How do I raise my children? What type of church do I join? Um, should I get involved in this relationship? Lord, how should I live my life as a believer? All of those things can be found in the preceptive will of God. Now, what is the preceptive will of God? The preceptive will of God is the part of God is a part of God's will that he reveals, not by dreams, not by prophetic word, but directly from his word. Mm, praise the Lord. It comes through the law of God, praise through the word of God. Hear me, beloved, this morning. It is so important for each of us that we, from time to time, that we remind ourselves that what can be known about God he has made it known. And I can know the answer to specific things about my life simply through the word of God. There are some times we run to others first for counsel. There are other times when we, we seek out certain things because we're frustrated inwardly, because we've been praying about something and we feel that the answer is not coming. And it's not that the Lord is not revealing it. It's simply he's saying it's found in my word. You must go to the word of God to find that answer for your life. Now, when it pertains to the will of God for your life, the Bible says several different things about God's will. That is found in his word for your life. And, to, and this morning, I want to emphasize and focus on what those things are. Um, just really quick before I share them with you, just turn to Psalms 119. Psalms 119, and let's look at verse 33 to 37. The psalmist here, you can, or we can really see his heart crying out to the Lord. Psalms 119, Verses 33 to 37. He cries out here. Why? Because he wants to know and understand what God had given him the understanding of his of his law, of the precept, of his preceptive will. The psalmist says here, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Hear me. The Lord is not looking for people who only hear the word. He's looking for those who will say, Lord, teach me how to obey your word. Amen. Teach me how to understand your word. When the Bible speaks of Moses, the Bible says that the children of Israel, they knew the hand of God. But Moses knew the ways of God. Oh, yeah. He knew the preceptive law of God. The psalmist goes on and says in verse 34, give me what? Understanding, not knowledge of the word. You see, at this point, the, the, the psalmist already knows the laws of the Lord. But what he is asking for is for understanding as to how to apply that knowledge to his life. He goes on and says, he says, give me understanding that I may keep your law and absorb it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commands or your commandments. For I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimony and not to selfish gain. Verse 37. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. This was the cry of the psalmist. Lord, teach me your will through your word, through your law. And this morning we can know God's will for our life. Through his word. I want to give you just a few points that the Bible emphasizes when it talks about the will of God for your life. Number one, what is God's will for your life? First, his will for your life is that you be saved. God's will for your life is for your salvation. Not only your salvation. But many of us, we have family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors who don't know the Lord. Now, we can approach people 
and tell people about the hand of God, what God can do for them. Or we can teach people that God's will, especially the unseen, that God's will for their life is that they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that they be saved and delivered from sin, from death, and ultimately from hell. Can we say amen this yeah. morning? The will of God for your life is that you be saved. Look at 1 Timothy chapters 2 and verse 3. 1 Timothy chapters 2 and verse 3. Paul writes here. He said, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. For this is good and it is pleasing in, uh, pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4, who desires what? That all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Peter goes on and writes. He says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. But is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is the heart of God, beloved. The heart of God is for his children to be saved. It is for sinners to come to repentance. It is for sinners to come to the saving grace and the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's will is that we are saved. Now, for most of us this morning, we have already come to that place of repentance. We have already received the Lord Jesus into our hearts. So now that we are saved, what is God's will for our life? Number two, the will of God for your life is that you be filled with the Spirit. That feeling there that the Bible is speaking about, it is speaking of being under total control of the Spirit. Mm. That you be under the influence, under the governance, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. God's will, now that you are saved, His will for your life is that you and I are governed by the Holy Spirit. That you be filled under the power, under the control, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Paul talks about, don't, don't be drunk with wine, but rather be filled with the Spirit. A person who is drunk is under the influence of alcohol. So he says, don't be under the influence of that, be under the influence of the Spirit. Amen. God's will is that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 18 and 19. I like how Paul puts it here. Paul, when, when he speaks of the Spirit... What he emphasizes here is the effects of or the result of being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. The Apostle Paul says here, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms. This is the result of being filled with the Spirit. That we address one another in psalms. That, 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 that we're filled with spiritual songs. All right? Singing and, uh, singing and making melody to the Lord in our heart. Verse 20. Giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the reverence of Christ. This is the effects of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. There's a heart of thanksgiving within us. We're submitted to one another. We're singing in praise and worship unto the Lord. We're living a lifestyle of worship unto the Lord. These are the effects. These are the results of being filled with the Spirit. Let me share something with you, beloved. The greatest demonstration of the power of God, even more than raising the dead, even more than healing the sick, even more than casting devils, it is your transformation. It is to see you being transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It is the transformation of your heart, of your character, of your entire being. This is the true miracle that, that, that those who don't know Jesus, they see and they, get and they come to the Lord. They look at your transformation and say, Lord, I desire that. 
more. This is what the world yes. is looking Hallelujah. for more than a message, more than words. The, the world is looking for evidence, and that evidence is found in your transformation. It is in our transformation. 2 Corinthians 5 17 talks about if any man be in Christ, he's a what? He's been transformed. The old has passed away. The old man has died. And behold, all things have become new. Even standing here this morning, when I look over my life where God took me from, it is truly a miracle from the Lord. And I believe many of us here this morning, when we look at how we used to be, we were trapped. We were hopeless. We were in darkness. Hear me this morning. There's an aspect to our humanity that just by default, we change over time. We mature over time. The Bible is not talking about just the changing of character. Even an unsaved person who doesn't have God can change their character. So that's not what the Bible is speaking. The message of the gospel, it is not about bad people who came to Jesus and became good. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is about dead people who were brought to life. It's a message of power that saves. We were dead to God because of our sin. We were dead to the things of the Lord. We could not hear. We did not know God, but through Jesus, he has made us alive in God. This is the message that I was once dead, but now I'm alive in Jesus. So this is the result of the Spirit working within us. After I've encountered the Holy Spirit, after he's moved in my heart, after he's done something in my core, even for some of us, the, the, the spirit's moving is so strong we can't even stand to our feet. Mm. But after we've gotten up, after we've left church, after we've done wiping our tears, beloved, the work of the spirit is still working. Amen. Because what he's doing now is transforming us from the core of who we are, ch changing us into the image of Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So these are the effects of what happens when we are filled with the Spirit. Number three, God's will for your life is not only for you to be saved. It is not only for you to be filled with the Spirit. God's will is for you to be sanctified. Amen. To be set apart. Jesus. But what are we being set apart from? From sin. Mm. From the world. From the devil, from the flesh. God's will is that you be sanctified. Let me tell you something. I think it's about time we start telling people the truth when they come to Jesus. It will cost you. Amen. Amen. Anyone who has come to Jesus and has not had to leave something, mm -hmm. I question whether they've come to Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> amen. <laughs> How many of us, when we came Amen. to the Lord, after walking with the Lord, we said to ourselves, my God, I didn't know it would be like this. <laughs> you got your, your family hating on you, friends hating on you. Go, I mean, the world is against you. Yes. The moment God removes you from the world, he saves you. He fills you with his spirit. The moment he sanctifies you, all the people you were cool with, they start disappearing. They start disappearing. Because the Lord, he puts a distinction on his children. Amen. This was his constant theme with Israel, especially after they were delivered out of Egypt. It was God this, making them to be distinct. And so he sets his law. Obey them. Obey them. Don't, don't, don't worship these idols. Don't, don't, don't practice these, these ways of these other nations. It was a constant distinction. 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 Mm -hmm. Amen. Jesus even told his disciples, if the world hates you, it's because they hated me. Mm -hmm. And if 
if you are in me, the world will hate you. Mm. The world will never be our friends. Mm. But we must understand that we've been called. We've been sanctified. We've been set apart. Now, what's interesting here, when we talk about God's will for your life being sanctified, Paul puts a, a very detailed definition of what that sanctification is. He specifically says, be sanctified from sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. I want to show you this. I thought it was very interesting. First, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's read that verse 1 to 8. First Thessalonians 4. 1 to 8. Paul says, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, it is your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. In other words, that no one take advantage of someone else. All right, he goes on and says, Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Verse 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. God has given his Holy Spirit to us to help us in those areas. That we abstain from such things. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 2. Look at what Peter says here. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. As believers, as we are living in this world, we are to no longer live after the desires of the flesh, but rather we are to live for the will of God. There's something about, in this case, um, sexual immorality or sexual sin that it literally, it puts those who practice it in bondage. It defiles their temple. It corrupts the spirit. Mm -hmm. God's love does not change. But what it does, it brings about a condemnation within the one who's practicing it. Mm -hmm. And where they feel that, that impurity that they have, it, it's, it's too much for them to come to God. There's something about that. And Paul, this is a constant theme throughout his letter. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. God wants us to be sanctified. He wants us to, to be set apart. He wants us to stay away from anything that will contaminate our spirit. Now, even though in this context, he's talking about sexual sin, we can go far beyond that. What we listen to. What we allow ourselves to watch. What we allow to enter into us. It is important that we guard ourselves from these things. Why? Because the, the only result or the only outcome of practicing such things or allowing or giving ourselves into such things is that they will corrupt us. They will corrupt us. And so it's important that we remain sanctified, separate from those things. Number four, what is the will of God for your life? It is for your submission. 
It is for your submission. Who are we submitting to, first and foremost, to the Lord? Secondly, who are we submitting to? To one another. Lastly, who are we submitting to? Even the Bible makes it clear that as believers, we are to submit even to human government as to be good citizens. Again, we understand when the when the government will the we we are not obedient to the government when they compromise our faith. Yeah. Right. No. But in terms of being citizens, obeying the law, Amen. they are required as believers to do so. Amen. God's will is for our submission to Him. Now, there are some who will say, Well, Pastor, I am submitted to God, and that is enough for me. I have my own walk with God, and that is enough. But anybody who studies the Bible knows that is not enough. God does not call for only submission to him. Thank you. Now, now I feel the pressure. I got to wipe my head. <laughs> Has a guy brought me napkins here? <laughs> my brother brought me napkins? All right, I'm going to wipe my head. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You see, he speaks my language. It's the ball head thing. He understands me. <laughs> um, and so it is important to understand that for those who say that, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm good with God. I got my own walk with the Lord. I'm submitted to the Lord. The Bible doesn't teach us that's, that's good enough. As believers, one of the benefits of the church, of the body, is that God calls us not only to submit to him, but to submit to one another. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There is nothing like a church family. Amen. Amen. We are not a building. Amen. The church are the people of God. Right. Jesus says, upon this rock, upon my identity, I will build my church. And against my church, the gates of hell will not prevail. We are to submit to one another. Now that may be something that is scary, because in today's culture, that word mm -hmm. submit is a curse word. Mm -hmm. In today's culture. Mm -hmm. To be governed under authority, to come under authority. But to be a believer, our viewpoint of submission it is not something of weakness. It is something of power. Amen. The one who can submit to God, the one who submits to the brethren, that person is powerful. Why? God strategically did this. He doesn't want the church, the body, to be divided. He doesn't want us to be living with our own, just in our own understanding. No. He wants us to be governed by love. Humility. He wants us to be governed by truthfulness, by understanding, compassion, forgiveness. This is what he wants within the church, within the body. He does not want us divided. He wants us united and learning to live in peace and love with one another. Now, some things don't just happen instantly. There's some things that takes time. It takes time. And there are some things the Lord says, y'all got to figure it out. <laughs> this is my will. Y'all got to make it happen. He leaves that up to us. But understanding that he has called us to, his will for us is that we be submitted to him, to one another, and be submitted to even to human government. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 7. James 4 and verse 7. When we talk about being submitted to God. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. I love what verse 8 says. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But that understanding that we are to submit ourselves, come under the governance of the Lord. Humble ourselves under God's authority. 
Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 to 17. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 to 17. Please just bear with me just a few more minutes. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 to 17. The word of God says here, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life. And imitate their faith. Amen. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. Verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledges his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Verse 17 says the same thing again. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Submit to even your leaders. Again, in our culture, presently speaking, this is a hard concept. Because the culture we're living in is a rebellious one. It's a one that is not governed by anything. In Thessalonians, Paul calls it, it's a lawless culture. Yes. But as believers, we are called not to be lawless, ungoverned, but we are called to humble ourselves and to be submitted to one another. Let me just give you one more practical example of that. Being submitted to one another, it requires a type of vulnerability. It requires trust. It truly does. It requires you and I not only just coming and sitting next to each other. It requires each of us opening our lives to one another. Covenant is what belongs to you now belongs to me. Your covering, I, you cover me, I cover you. My protection is your protection. Your protection is my protection. This is what submitting to one another looks like. It is not just, you're not just, oh, that's my spiritual family. You are my family. You are my family. And as I said earlier, I know this requires time. Patience. Diligence. We have to be patient with one another. We have to leave from the, from, look at the book right here, and you see the distance where I am. We have to leave room for error with one another. Yes. We have to leave room for yes. offense with one another. Yes. We have to leave room for forgiveness. Yes. 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 How someone else may do something may not be the way I do it. Yes. I may not even like how somebody does something, but guess what? Yes. I've got to accept it and embrace them. Yes. I have to be willing and open to see our differences as not something to drive us apart, but something that should bring us together. Yeah. Something that should give us a greater appreciation for one another. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it will take time. So God's will is that we are submitted to him, submitted to one another, and submitted to human government. We have to be good citizens. Fifth, number five. I promise you this is in the Bible. <laughs> I promise you that. God's will is that we suffer. Yes. 
Now, suffer in what way? The Bible speaks about several types of suffering. So we're going to eliminate one of them. We're not talking about suffering because of sin. We're talking about suffering for doing what is right in the eyes of God. Doing what is right in the eyes of God. Amen. Paul speaks about this. God has given me a thorn in my flesh, and 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 he is his character is under persecution. He's fighting false apostles, false brethren, false teachers. People who are trying to distort the gospel. And yet believers within the body, they're attacking his character. Yeah. There's a type of suffering that the Lord, it is his will for us to, to go through it. Why? Because going through that type of suffering, knowing we've done nothing wrong, Knowing because we've chosen to stand for the, for the will of God. We've chosen to live set apart unto the Lord. And people are persecuting us. People are, 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 are accusing us. People are looking down upon us. They're mocking us because of our lifestyle and our faith in Jesus. That type of suffering pleases the Lord. Why? Because when we find ourselves doing the right things, when we find ourselves living the type of life that pleases the Lord and the world begins to persecute us, what God does, he doesn't leave us abandoned. No, he covers us with the grace to endure it. God loves the believer who is able to endure suffering for righteousness sake. There is nothing that pleases God when the, more, than, more than when the world persecutes his children. Why? Because his name is being made known. He loves it when his children suffer for righteousness sake. Look at 1 Peter. Actually, um, look at 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. And then we'll go to 1 Peter. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Paul says it here. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You're to expect it. If you live a godly life in the Lord, you will be persecuted. People will attack your character. People will come after your faith. People will mock you. You to expect. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. For it is better to suffer doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. What pleases the Lord is not when we suffer because of wrong we've done. What pleases God is when we suffer because we've done the right thing. Amen. This pleases the Lord. Let's stay in First Peter. Look at chapters 4 and verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Amen. So while you are in the midst of suffering for living for God, for living a godly life, we are to entrust ourselves to the Lord. <coughs> and God will not leave me in this suffering. Right. But God will cover me. He will give me the strength to go through it. Remember in Philippians 4.13 when Paul says, For I can do all things. That all things he's saying, I can do whatever life throws my way. I can do it. Why? Because Christ strengthens me. Earlier in Philippians, he talks about what Christ strengthens him with. He talks about a supernatural peace that goes beyond understanding. While I'm suffering for doing the will of God, for doing the right things, God strengthens me with peace that I'm not moved by what's happening on the outside of me. What is in me is calm, collect, and courage. There's nothing 
more that pleases the Lord when the world is trying to break us and, and yet they can't break us. They're looking at you what? waiting for you to break down, waiting for you to just lose your mind. But there's nothing more that pleases the Lord when the believer is in the fire and stands firm and says, my God will deliver me. My God will deliver me. This pleases God. So he strengthens us with a peace that goes even beyond understanding. Amen. That I'm not moved. Hallelujah. And lastly, God's will for our life is that we live a life not of complaining, not of bickering, not of backbiting. That's not why he gave us the mouth. The mouth was even given to us even more for food. But his will is that we live a life of thanksgiving. Yes. Praise. Adoration. That out of our mouth will come praise, adoration, love, thanksgiving for our Father. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. The will of God for my life is to live a life of thanksgiving. The songs that we sing, they are an expression of thanksgiving. But what pleases God beyond the song is a life that is lived in thanksgiving. Amen. That's what pleases God. It is a lifestyle. Do you know in the Old Testament, the, the word for worship, in the New Testament, the word for worship is poskonia. That word means to kiss, to lick. If you have a pet or dog, when your dog comes and they're yeah. licking you, they're adoring you, they're loving you, <laughs> as nasty as it is. <laughs> they ain't cleaning your skin. They're showing you love or affection. Yeah. Yeah. But in the Old Testament, the word for worship, shakal, it means to bow down, to prostrate before. This is what worship looked like. Worship, it, what is this? This is an act of submission. It is a life that is fully submitted to God. It is a life that is laid before the Lord in complete and total trust. And Give thanks in all circumstances. Not some. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is hard to give thanks for something I don't understand. Yes. But there is something you can understand in all circumstances. The emphasis here, I know we see circumstances, and so we're drawn to that word. But there's something more here. Give thanks in all circumstances. To be able to do that, we must be able to understand not the circumstance, but the God of the circumstance. Amen. When my eyes are upon Jesus, I can give thanks in all circumstances. Amen. Because it does not matter what I will go through in life. As long as I can see Jesus in the midst of it, I can give thanks. Hallelujah. I don't have to wait to come out of it to give thanks. I can be in the midst of all things, but as long as I see Jesus, I can give thanks to him. That's the key to giving thanks. I can give thanks because of who my eyes are set upon. Open my eyes to see Jesus seated upon the throne. Let me leave you with this. All of these things are wonderful. The will of God for our life. That we're saved. That we're filled with the Spirit. That we're sanctified. That we submit to God. We submit to one another. We submit to, to governing authorities. That, that, that we suffer for doing what is right. That we live a life of thanksgiving. But what is all of that for? What is God really saying to us? When, when, when we really look at all of these things here. God has
has never strayed from his original plan with man, and that is to be intimate with his creation. God wants fellowship. Yes. All of these things, they are guidelines to keep us into mm-hmm. complete and total oh, yes. fellowship with the Lord. Now watch this. Some of us who may say, okay, Pastor, but there are more detailed things about my life. There's more detailed questions that I have in terms of God's will. So what about those things? Here's how the Bible lays it out. When you are governed by these things, by the preceptive law of God, it does not matter what you do because the Spirit will govern you. And so all of it will work for your glory. Yes. It will all work for your good. The Spirit will show you what to desire. Yes. The Spirit will govern you according to the preceptive word of the Lord. Amen. And so even when I'm praying for direction, Lord, where do I go? Okay, what does the word of God say? Okay. The, the Bible makes it clear. I, I, I shouldn't go down or go anywhere that will take me off track, that will lead me away from the Lord. Okay, so I'm going to X that job out, X that house out. I'm going to cross this out. Okay, this one here fits within the guideline of what God's law says. Okay, I'm going to take a step forward towards this. This is how he guides you now. Yes. He guides you according to his preceptive word. Everything you need, God has given you. By his spirit and through his word. Yes. If you allow the spirit to govern your life, and if you allow the word of God to govern your life, everything, every place you go, every decision yes, you God. make will always work for Amen. your good. Amen. But more importantly than working for your good, it will keep you in fellowship with yes. the Lord. Amen. That is what all of this is about. It is not about rules or regulations. God does not want anything to hinder us from complete fellowship with him. He desires intimacy with you. He desires fellowship with you. God wants to reveal himself to you. And all of these guidelines, they keep us safe. They keep us in the will of God. They allow us to walk in communion with the Lord and not be hindered by anything. That is what God desires. He wants relationship with us. Oh, the love of God. Oh, the love of God. When God has pulled you from somewhere, you you don't know the love of God until God has pulled you from somewhere. Oh, the love of God. What a God we serve. That he himself will become the sacrifice to redeem us. Why? So that we can live in fellowship with Him. What a God we serve. Can you stand to your feet this morning? And if you will, just forget about who's around you just for a moment. And just for a minute, just thank the Lord this morning for His will for your life. You know that you cannot control the things you don't know. You leave that with the Lord. But what you do know is found in his word. Thank him that God has made his will known to you this morning. Ask him for the grace and the strength to live in obedience to that will, to his word, to his law this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for making a way, oh God, through your word, through your law, that we don't have to be confused, that, that, that we don't have to be stressed over things that you've already given the answer for. Thank you, Father, for, for giving us understanding, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be governed by your spirit, to be governed through your preceptive law. Father, even questions we may have, help us, Lord, to go to your word to seek those things. Holy Spirit, guide us, Lord. May the word of the Lord produce truth in every area of our life, Lord. May your spirit transform us daily into the image of Jesus. May it conform our will to the will of the Lord. We don't want anything that has to do with us. We only desire, Lord, what pleases you. We only desire your will, and we thank you this morning, Lord. Thank you this morning. Thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord. And as your hands are lifted, if I can just bless you. Beloved, the Lord bless you. 
the Lord keep you. Amen. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Amen. The Lord be gracious to you. Amen. May the Lord's countenance be turned towards you. Amen. And may the Lord give you peace. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, can somebody give the Lord praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will, uh, you guys can be seated. I'm not, I'm not going to hold you. Uh, if you can prepare your tithes and offerings. Hezekiah, Patrick, you guys will come down. Help me again, Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. If you guys want to grab me the baskets, and if you would, take up your position. Bless God. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to hold up your offering, it's not see me what I'm doing, Lord. It is not see me what I'm doing, Lord. It is a wave offering unto the Lord. As Pastor Deshaun said, it is a thank you. It is a thank you for what you have provided us, Lord. We are returning a portion to you. We are grateful for what you are doing. We are thankful for what you are doing. What you have done, are doing, and will continue to do, Father. I thank you right now in the name of Jesus, Father, that each and every household is blessed in this place, Lord God. And we just make a declaration, Lord, that if a portion is blessed, the lump is blessed. Hallelujah.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have not had the opportunity to take a look, pray over, and sign up for, there's a QR code there for ministries. Again, if yours is not there, if you don't see it, there's a slot that says other. Feel free to write in the ministry that the Lord is leading you to. The gift things that he has called you, placed in you, and so forth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Again, as I said at the beginning, we're going to start here very soon, starting next month, getting things a little bit more in place. Uh, and again, the youth are probably at the forefront of our thinking right now. Okay? Moving.